Welcome to another episode of Implants Made Simple. I'm Dr. Robert Stanley, Smile Engineer, and today what we want to do is we want to talk about the concepts of crestal bone loss versus wound healing around a dental implant. So let's get right into it. Say you've got a, a, a tooth that's coming out, it needs to come out, and you extract that tooth. And then by using the Stanley five thread rule, you determine that you can get an implant into this space because it's engaging five threads at least at a minimum, five threads on the facial and five threads on the lingual. So you have socket stability. And then you graft the site and you put a temporary on it, say for instance, a non-functional um, healing abutment or a non-functional provisional itself, and you let it heal. And ideally you would see something like this, right? But we don't see this. And what we see is we see a little bit of soft tissue that has to grow around the implant interface. So on the left, what I've shown is from this platform switched implant. So the implant's platform is a little bit more narrow than the implant itself. So that's called platform switched. Notice that the, 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 the pink, which represents the combination in this, in this video, the combination of connective tissue and, and epithelium. Notice that there's a little bit of pink here that comes down and it attaches a little bit below the, the platform level. And in this case, let's call it 500 microns or half a millimeter. Now on this side over here, let's say we have a different outcome. Let's say on this side, the bone actually attaches and seals right there on the top of the implant. Now it's possible that this could happen, but what, I, what I'm proposing here today is that when you take this crown out and you look down, this crown and or abutment out, and you look down inside here, you almost always see pink right? You, you never look in here and see bone uh, coming off the implant and up and then pink starting, skin starting above it. What you see is you see pink. So at a maximum, the best we could have would be this. But if we had this, there's really no room for connective tissue. If this is an epithelial attachment, it, it's driving the epithelial cells down to maybe one layer of cells with no connective tissue underneath. Whereas in this case, Maybe you have uh, 250 microns of connective tissue and another 250 microns of epithelium, and you create a nice seal around the implant. Now, if we superimpose the original socket that the tooth went into, it would look like this with the green dotted line. And why this is so, so very important at this moment in time is the following. When we place this implant, this area here had no bone because this is the socket. There was no bone here to start with, nor was there bone here. In fact, there was no bone here or here. So the bone had to grow. If the bone grows and it looks like this outcome on the left or it looks like this outcome on the right, either way, you don't have crustal bone loss because there was no bone there in the first place. There was a tooth there. You took the tooth out, there was an air gap there, and you graft the gap. So calling this crustal bone loss is a little bit of a, of a misnomer, I think. Uh, I like to say, I like to go with the, the prevailing uh, concept that what you want to do is you want to take a baseline radiograph about one year after you load the implant, perfectly perpendicular to the platform of the implant, such that you can monitor your crustal bone levels over time. Uh, you can't say with one radiograph that you have crestal bone loss or wound healing uh, because you only have a snapshot in time. What you need to do is you need to have at least two points in time, a starting point, a reference frame, and some point later on in time that you can then compare back to the original. And therefore, you can, you can differentiate between wound healing, whether you have outstanding wound healing or, or maybe the okay wound healing, or maybe it goes down a little bit lower down to the first thread, a little less than ideal uh, wound healing. Uh, but that's a difference. That's a difference from continually losing bone over time, crustal bone loss. Okay? So if we look down into a healed site, so this was an implant we placed, we placed it in an immediate socket. We placed it three millimeters. This is a green regular three abutment. So it's three millimeters tall. It's regular uh, in diameter. And when we take this out, this is what we see. 
we have this beautiful band of, of attached keratinized gingiva all the way around our implant. It rolls in and you can see the little fibers as it rolls in and the, the texture of the tissue changes from epithelium to about a third of the way down in here. And if we call this three millimeters because the healing about was three millimeters, we have about one millimeter of epithelium and then we have about two millimeters of connective tissue. The red, the red spots that you see here are where you have the tears in the vascularity of the connective tissue that was attached to the healing abutment. And this is where the concept of one abutment one time comes from because the idea, which makes a lot of sense, to put an abutment in and not take it out so that you do not disturb this healing process and you keep this, this nice tight seal around your implant makes a lot of sense. But you can see clearly from this picture right here, and I've never seen it in my entire clinical career, that if I look down in here, I would see a millimeter or two millimeters of bones sitting up above the platform of my implant. It may look like that in the radiograph because the lingual bone is higher than the buccal bone in most cases, but clinically, there's a nice tight epithelial seal. So I hope that helps to kind of clarify the difference between crestal bone loss versus wound healing immediately after implant placement. This has been another episode of Implants Made Simple. I'm Dr. Robert Stanley, Smile Engineer, out.